Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke chapter 6, beginning at the 39th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus also told them a parable. Can a blind man guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? The disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take the speck out of let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad fruit tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of the heart, produces good, and the evil person, out of the evil treasure, produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. That one is like one building a house, who dug deeply and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood rose, the river burst against that house, but could not shake it, because it had been built well. But the one who hears and does not act is like the person who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, immediately it fell, and great was the ruin of that house. For the Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words that flow from my mouth be inspired by your Holy Spirit. Amen. I just noticed my uh, t shirt matches my name on the screen. I thought about that long and hard, obviously. I have heard that there um, are a number of preachers, and I know some of them, who swear by the formula that you should always begin your sermon with a joke or a funny story to capture everybody's attention. Well, you might be surprised that the passage that Anne read for us today is actually Jesus ending his message or his sermon with some jokes, or some riddles, perhaps. Uh, Bishop Tom Wright, in his translation of this passage, actually translates those first few words as, Jesus told them this riddle. Now, don't get me wrong, I do believe the Bible is serious business, and what we read is the living word of God but it is also littered with many moments of subtle and more obvious humour. Fun and laughter and humour a part of the image of God in which we are created. And so it's no surprise to me that we see aspects of this element of God's character over and over and over again throughout Scripture. Leanne and I quite enjoy going to see um, a good stand-up comedian on the odd occasion. And more recently, we are, um, we've discovered that on the, the streaming services that we subscribe to, um, I understand we sub subscribe to too many of them, um, but there are some great comedy shows um, available on those. And we've actually got tickets um, booked in three weeks' time to see Pete Hellier, um, one of the presenters um, on the project, and we're hoping and hoping that he's way better than the last comedian we saw who had a connection to the project. I've got to say, Dave Hughes, worst comedian we have seen live, but that's just, I'm sure we just got him on a bad night. But um, anyway, good comedian um, can make um, a great night out in our experience. 
One of the things that I've noticed about some comedians is that they have this innate gift of drawing our attention to what needs to be named and confronted about our world, our culture and issues that we need to attend to or to think differently about. They pick up on the zeitgeist and through the use of humour can often challenge our response to what's going on in the world. I've heard some really powerful but also very funny comedy shows cover issues like mental illness, racial discrimination, and gun violence and gun control in America, just to name a few. It has made me think a little as um, what's unfolded, um, particularly in the Ukraine this week, um, about whether uh, the Ukrainian president, who is a former actor and comedian, might be drawing on that particular skill to unify uh, his people. I know there is a sense of, of heaviness about our world at the moment. Um, but we sang a hymn at the beginning of the 7, uh, 730 service this morning um, that had a line in it, um, uh, the healing art of laughter, um, which I thought was really beautiful. And, and I, I do wonder whether uh, the, the gift uh, that uh, this particular man might bring to his, his people at that time might be able to help them uh, to get through one of the darkest uh, moments in uh, their history. Today's gospel reading uh, falls at the end of what is known as the Sermon on the Plain. And we've been working through this part of Luke's gospel over the last three weeks. I can't help but wonder, in Jesus' use of ironic humour, if we're not seeing Jesus draw the attention to the first century Jewish zeitgeist in the same way that a good comedian might do in our day and age. With the same desire to make those who heard him walk away thinking that they might have to change the way that they think or act about the world in which they live in and how God might be at work in that world. I also can't help but wonder whether there's a lot in this passage that is still very relevant for us in 2022. As we leave the Sermon on the Plain, what does Jesus want us to walk away thinking about? Or perhaps more specifically, what is Jesus calling us to act on or even change? Although Luke says that Jesus told them a parable, it's kind of really five together in the one group. I love the words that Bishop Tom Wright uses to explain these words. He says that these words that Jesus uses are Jesus' most vivid word sketches. But we need to worry, wonder as we, we digest these word sketches whether they're just a random collection of Jesus' sayings or do these vivid word sketches of blindness, of classroom participation, of vision impairment, of fruit growing and flood preparation link together for one overarching message in some way. And that's why Luke says it's a parable. So let's have a little bit of a look uh, through the sections of um, the end of uh, the Sermon on the Plain. Verse 39 has all the ingredients for classic sketch comedy. Can't you just imagine uh, your favourite uh, sketch comedy group? For me, I'm imagining Monty Python. Um, Reenact two blind dudes just walking down uh, the road only to find themselves falling into a big sinkhole that's been created by all the rain that's washed away the house in verse 49. The blind leading the blind uh, is a term that we've come to adopt in our culture and our generations as well. Um, but it's not original to Jesus. There's actually evidence of Hindu, Buddhist and Roman writing that predates Jesus using that same imagery of the blind leading the blind. 
But it's a little bit different when Jesus uses it in this context. Rather than just being an image of ridicule and comedy, when Jesus uses this image, which is likely a well-known common saying of the time, it's laced with poignant theological and social commentary. If you were here with us a few weeks ago, you might remember what he said in Nazareth. Jesus says that the blind are not to be avoided. They're not to be ridiculed. In fact, they will be amongst the groups of people that Jesus will attend to. That's where we will find Jesus alongside those who are blind. And so we begin to witness what I am calling this morning the comic genius of Jesus. We might be laughing at the idea of two blind people falling down a hole, but Jesus wants us to be with them. And he's with the blind people. He's lifting them up out of their holes. And so... We can't be blind as well. Ah, that's what Jesus is trying to say amongst this ironic humour. Most of us are pretty slow and sometimes we need the punchlines explained. I was um, spending a little bit of time um, online with one of our parishioners trying to explain the origin of the group Angley cans and I had to explain a few times before he got it he wasn't a dad so maybe he didn't get the dad joke um, that is the can of beer if you hadn't get, got the uh, allusion that Mary Ann I thought did quite well this morning but some of us are like that we, we need those punchlines explained we don't quite get the message straight away and so again a good comedian will bring those themes back in different ways So Jesus also continues these vivid word sketches. The one that he uses, though, in verse 40 starts to complicate the imagery somewhat. It's not as simple as they might first have thought of. I mentioned in the first week that we looked at this section of Luke's Gospel that the Sermon on the Plain was delivered to Jesus' disciples. So it makes sense that when he uses this uh, teacher, disciple, student imagery, that they would immediately think that Jesus is the teacher and they are the students. But this is a multi-layered, vivid word sketch. Firstly, they're encouraged to value the teachings of Jesus above any other sort of teaching that is on offer for them, particularly that of the scribes and the Pharisees. They have access to the best teacher Ever. But at some point, every good teacher wants their students to become taught. And at some point, these disciples, these students will be fully qualified. And they too will become teachers themselves. So we need to ask ourselves what sort of pedagogy, what sort of understanding of the way that they teach will they apply? And what type of people will they seek out to teach? And as the disciples are hearing this ironic humour, I'm imagining the light bulb going off in their head going, ah, I think we get it. That's right type of people that Jesus wants us to be around are the poor, the captive, the blind, and the oppressed. The poor, the hungry, the sad, the hated, and the excluded. And they're to teach them to a point where these people who are on the margins of society might themselves become teachers. Are you starting to get Jesus' ironic humour? comedy genius of Jesus. But wait, there's more zingers to come. Using the classic comedy device of hyperbole or exaggeration, 
Jesus starts talking about specks and logs. Who could possibly have a whole log in their eye? Comedy gold. But again, Jesus is using this vivid word sketch to get his disciples to start to think differently. If they need to be hanging out with the poor, the captive, the blind and the oppressed, the poor, the hungry, the sad and the excluded and the hated, and if they need to be more than hanging out with them, they need to be serving and teaching them, then they can't be consumed by the faults and failings of those people. They need to worry about their own ability to be an example. They need to ask themselves what might be blocking their vision from seeing them in the same way that Jesus will see them or seeing them at at all. The logs of prejudice, bias, self-focus, pride, status, reputation, influence and position all need to be removed so that we can see clearly what Jesus sees. That all are worthy of love and all are invited to participate in the kingdom of God. We don't set the dress regulations and the entry requirements to the kingdom of God. Our role is to be the welcomers and the teachers. But to be able to do those two roles, there's some serious logging to be done. Verse uh, verse 43 through to verse 47 contains the most developed of Jesus' five vivid word sketches. Perhaps because this particular word sketch is the one that should make us stop and think the most. The one that should make us stop and check who we are and how we're responding the most. It certainly was the one that made me stop and think the most. The interesting thing about this word sketch is if you look close enough, you actually find the answer to the riddle. On the surface, it might seem obvious about what Jesus' main point is. Good trees, good fruit. Bad trees, bad fruit. Good people, good fruit. Bad people, bad fruit. But hang on. Is it that simple? What's going on inside of us at the heart should be reflected by the actions that show forth in our lives. That seems to be really consistent with the teachings of Jesus, but also in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel It says, for the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. But, and it is a big but, I cannot lie. That was a bit of Stuart Perry comedy gold, if you pick that one up. People who don't have Jesus in their hearts can still do good things. Even those who we might see as the worst of the worst can do good. Just because we have Jesus in our hearts doesn't mean we will always do good things. Followers of Jesus need to be forgiven as often and as regularly as those who don't know Jesus. Good trees don't always produce good fruit. Sometimes it takes a really long time for a tree to bear fruit, but it still can be healthy on the way to bearing fruit. Sometimes the fruit doesn't ripen or it gets sour or it gets attacked by insects or disease. That doesn't mean the the tree is inherently bad. But on the other hand, bad trees 
can sometimes produce a decent piece of fruit. Up until recently, we had this mangy-looking lemon tree in our backyard in a wooden tub. And it took years and years and years for this mangy little tree um, to even look like it was going to grow a lemon. But then all of a sudden, these massive lemons started to grow. The tree didn't look healthy in any way at that time. And I have no doubt that at some point in time, it would have stopped bearing fruit. Um, But we had to get rid of it because we had termites eat all the wood around the wooden pot and we had to get rid of it. So it makes you wonder where Jesus is wanting his disciples to go with this imagery. He's already got them thinking in ways that they didn't expect. So what's running through their hand? What is the challenge that he wants them to engage in? What is the answer to this riddle that Jesus has laid before us? Having a change of heart, that is part of the answer but it's not by itself enough. Action is part of it. But also, it's not enough by itself. Having a change of heart and acting on it together, well, that's part of it. But even those two alone together isn't the full answer to the riddle. The answer to this series of ironic humour, riddles that I think was probably delivered with a smile and some dry Jewish humour is that it's about having a heart changed by Jesus and, and acting on that change of heart in a direction towards those who are poor, captive, blind and oppressed, in a direction of those who are poor, hungry, sad, hated and excluded. That's the full picture. Easy. We've got it. Let's go. But wait, that actually sounds really, really hard to do. It sounds hard to do once, let alone for that to become part of that everyday life and walk with Jesus. And that's where the image of a flooded southeast Queensland can help. Somewhat ironic uh, that we have a passage on a flooded uh, Sunday morning uh, that involves uh, this image. Uh, The person who who read this passage at a 7.30 service came up to me and said, Stuart, do you really, really want me to read this last bit? I said, yeah, yeah, it's pretty crucial to my sermon, so please read it. (laughs) In this final uh, of the word, vivid word sketches, Jesus shows how we can make the answer to this riddle part of our faith journey. We don't just rush off blindly thinking we've got it and we can put it into action and we can immediately change the world. What this imagery encourages us to do is to dig in to Jesus. The foundation of any house isn't just one pillar. It's not just one beam. We work together with other pillars and beams who have also dug into Jesus to be taught, to be formed, to be shaped by Jesus. The household of God is never just Jesus and me. It's always a community of people whose gifts and talents complement, supplement, strengthen and stabilise our own. We just might find ourselves being put into action much sooner than we expect or we feel that we are ready for. In my personal experience, this is highly likely to happen. But if it was up to us, we'd leave ourselves sitting on the benches thinking we're not ready enough We don't know enough, and we're certainly not holy enough. But we can't overlook who it's all about and where Jesus will be. 
with the poor, the captive, the blind, and the oppressed. The poor, the hungry, the sad, and the hated. With the excluded of our world. And so, that's where we should go. Jesus, the comic genius. Makes you think, doesn't it? Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the healing art of laughter in our world. We thank you for part of the way that you have taught us is to challenge us by using irony and images and words that really stop and make us think. But help us not to just have a wry smile and a chuckle and move on. Help us to stay in these moments, to dwell on them, to have them sink in, that we might be changed, that we might influence our world in ways that we could not even imagine. As we look at our world at the moment and feel a sense of helplessness, as we look and hear the drumbeats of war around us and ask, what can we do? Help us to know that the answer is to cling to you, to dig into you, and to cling to others around us and to form a foundation from which our small efforts, empowered by the Holy Spirit, can make an insurmountable difference far above than we could all imagine or hope. Help us to see you at work, to have the confidence that we are not alone. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. That's it.